when me and Paul were talking, he was kind of asking like what you do. And I was like, he does a lot of different stuff. Like he's a jujitsu black belt. I know he's a professional gamer. Um, you're part of Happy Punch or something yeah. to do with that? So I'm, I'm one of the heads over at Happy Punch as well. And that is like, um, uh, that is a big, I don't even know how to explain it. It's, it's like a team and a media outlet and we do podcasts and create content. We do, we're doing like half a billion views a month over there for Happy Punch. We're the, I think, I believe that crazy, man. those numbers are, make us the biggest in the space for combat sports. Mm-hmm. which is crazy that's, which is that's, insane. that's, that's yeah. incredible isn't it? yeah it's, i've looked at some mad. of your stuff i've been looking over the last few days mm. and um obviously you do a lot of the youtube celebrity boxing content and all that sort of stuff don't they right yeah and then i so I, I do all that and then like out in vegas we do like watch parties and stuff for the fights like obviously the jake paul mike perry fights happening so like watch parties for that watch party for for ufc fights i work with a lot of things out here so i do a, a lot of different things um we're basically like professional gamer uh Technically a professional fighter, I'm one and two, <laughs> which is not great. But, you know, I was yeah. jiu-jitsu black belt, so they're like, oh, you should box uh, this <laughs> professional sense. boxer. And I'm like, well, okay, but it's different, but all right. You know, so yeah, I fought mate, two yeah. professional boxers, technically, um, and then uh, one – Then you fight FaZe like, Temper? Was it FaZe yeah. Temper and someone else? Face. Yeah, I fought FaZe Sensei, who was the only professional fighter in the scene back in 2018. And then I fought FaZe mm-hmm. Temper on like four days' notice. And he's been – He's massive boxing. as well. And he's like six foot four. Five oh, yeah. He? He's six four. And then on top of that, he's been boxing as long as I've known him. You know, like he's only <laughs> been boxing seriously for a couple of years. But he was already fighting for like – since – he's already training, striking since he was 15. And then he started boxing like – for years before we fought and it was like four day notice and also that's my guy like i live on that man's couch so it's kind of like a, <laughs> oh, really? it's kind of like a weird situation yeah what 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 came first was it gaming was it jujitsu i mean you just said that boxing came after jujitsu so obviously a black but you must have been training for a while i guess yeah so back in um when i was like 14 my dad saw a boxing match he's like watching a boxing match i just got back from school he's like uh watching this match and he's like Pat, boxing's on. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go downstairs, and the guy kicks the other guy in the head, knocks him down, is ground and pounds him, uh, and the fight finishes. He's like, wait, what? Like, what is happening here? Why is this allowed? Like, this is all illegal. And then he realizes it's not boxing, it's UFC. And he goes, I've never even heard of this. The next, maybe within the next week, he looks up a U- uh, MMA gym in the area, and we go and start training. And that was when I was like 14. And I just happen to like jujitsu a lot more than ever, all the other aspects. So I've been training jujitsu since I've been 14 years old, which is great. And now I'm 33. Okay. So, so I've definitely been doing that for a while. And then um, in 2009, I was making for, – for a few years before, I was kind of posting on like message boards for gaming. So like Call of Duty message boards or whatever game I was playing at the time, I'd like kind of – I was big into talking to other people in the community for, hey, how do you do this or – this is the class setup that I use. And I was doing that on message boards. And then from there, when, when YouTube came out, I was watching a lot of YouTubers. And so I just took what I did on message boards and I started doing it on YouTube, like making Call of Duty videos, uh, mostly in the like sniping, uh, like montage, same stuff that like FaZe Clan yeah. did. I was doing a yeah, lot of yeah. that. And then I would do class setup videos and that kind of just gradually became um, you know, me doing real life vlogs to gaming vlogs to traveling. I competed a little bit in the professional scene. And um, so from that, it kind of went into all the YouTube boxing stuff that happened back in 2018. And now obviously we all know KSI and Jake Paul and Logan Paul and those guys. So I'm involved with all that stuff through there. It's funny how everything leads, right? Because I was posting gaming videos, it just it grew my audience to, to a point where I started um, – being in these like more mainstream, like almost celebrity boxing matches. And now that's mostly what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us. It supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. It's crazy, isn't it? Mm. So what was the what was the original game that you started playing? What Call of Duty was it? So I started posting uh, during... I was, 
I was kind of doing a little bit of stuff back during MW2, but I started posting consistently during Black Ops 1, which was in 2010. Oh, okay. I think it came out in 2010, I believe. Yeah, so that's why yeah, I posted around like that, a yeah. lot. Yeah, I was posting like Super Smash Brothers, and then Black Ops 1 came out, and it was like my favorite game ever. So um, I started posting a ton during that time. And I think I went from posting like a few videos a week to doing two or three videos a day. And Fucking it's just, and that's uh that's the history. And now we're here and I'm on your podcast, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think when you, when you get in it early like that, like, you know, you, you see like you hear Tim, the tap man and people like that, uh-huh. you're such early adopters of YouTube, like you're yeah. like the pioneers, the people who start it. And then like, you just build from there, don't you? Yeah. It's crazy. Like all the guys now that have, you know, millions of subscribers, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. These are all guys that exploded and have been around for a long time. And I was kind of big, like, before it got mainstream. I think my height on YouTube was probably 2017. So in the Call of Duty scene, I was one of the bigger guys um, up until about 2015. And then I started – I was working at GameStop, if you guys are – I know that you guys yeah. don't have GameStop out there, but you have, we, like, we have, game. We have game. We have game. game I'm familiar yeah. because of, the, uh, I'm familiar because of the, the, the shares, mate, and the, uh, the <laughs> stock market. The stonks. Yeah. 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 The so I was working at yeah. GameStop, <laughs> and I got fired. And because I got fired, I went super hard on YouTube. I got fired in 2015, started going really hard on YouTube. Uh, and that whole story of how I got fired went very viral because I got fired for actually, like, leaking the new Call of Duty before anybody had announced it. We, we used to get the <laughs> – the um, marketing materials like super early so yeah. i was like you know this is good for my youtube channel i opened up the box is very bad of me to do GameStop, i'm sorry etc uh but now we're past the point of um you know it's what, what is the uh i can't think because i just woke up guys but it, it's past <laughs> the point of whatever the court date thing is yeah so yeah, yeah i leaked black ops 3 uh which was good for me bad for overall like GameStop changed a lot of their uh guidelines and rules around marketing materials because of me and then activision had threatened to sue me for like 10 grand or something which at the time i had never even seen 10 grand in my life i didn't know that was a amount of money that people just had so uh, i instead of getting instead of going to court and all that they're like we could we could forget all that if you go back and delete all these posts and we fire you so that's what happened <laughs> that's crazy I, I remember like the, the, I don't know what they're called it's like kind of like non-disclosures that you have like I used to own a game shop in Plymouth uh-huh. and when I used to um, buy new games they used to send you like a little thing in like big letters like you do not show anyone this right. until this date if you put any promotion out like even like a card or anything they fucking see you yeah I totally disregarded all of that and I just did it anyway. <laughs> Open the box, put it out. Not good. Was that kind of that that video that of, of you doing that? Was that what kind of projected you into to being sort of YouTube famous? Yeah. So the, so I was already big in the Call of Duty scene, and once I started, once I did that that story because GameStop's such a big like uh, thing, obviously out here, and because it's so big in the the gaming world. That kind of took me from being a just just a Call of Duty YouTuber that like if you play Call of Duty you might know me. It took me from that to like if you play games you probably heard of me back then, you know, because it was such a, a massive like news story at the time. And that was the first thing that really um, that that was my first month where I instead of making like a grand I made twenty two thousand dollars or something that month. Uh, so yeah, that definitely that hey, definitely. What was that up. like? What was that like that first time? Like you just earned a silly amount of money. You must have been like I can't fucking believe it. Yeah, like oh, it, it I, I was, just feel like, it's like free money, isn't it? It just it, feel, oh, it must feel crazy. It was like free money, yeah. And it de- I was def- like that month when I made that fat check, I was like, "Oh, I'm rich beyond belief." Oh, we're going out, guys. I'm paying for everything. It's cool. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was actually probably uh, it was. It was the first time that I made such significant money that uh, I was like, "Oh." I, I could see the vision. I could see like how big it could get, you know, because before that I was making like a thousand, two thousand dollars a month from YouTube. And then that 20 K month was just like, it just opened up the door for me to be like, Oh, I, I can't go back now to like a regular, like nine to five. I can't go back and work at GameStop because I'm banned from working there. Uh, <laughs> but you know, yeah, it was, it was insane. It was definitely a very good high. So when you, uh, when you obviously you broke through and then obviously you're, you're doing your call of duty, you, you said you moved into like vlogs and different type of stuff. How was it, how was it like transition from like going to call of duty to then vlogging? Cause I see you now with like a lot of like 
celebrities and, and and a lot of different gamers and you said you stayed in phase phase clan's house and lived there and all that sort of stuff so tell us a little bit more about that yeah so um i think that uh the transition was really pretty smooth because i was making so much gaming content and all my stuff was pretty much call of duty and you watch like uh I'm sure you've seen like Call of Duty cut goms and stuff back in the day. Yeah. And so I was making a lot of those style videos. And then once the GameStop thing leaked, I started making a lot of content around that. So that involved me like going to the actual store. So I had to like film. It became like more of a gaming. I became more of a gaming vlogger. So I would do some Call of Duty mixed in with like, all right, guys, today we're going to the GameStop. Uh, We're going to the GameStop down the street. Uh, If you see me there, uh, say what's up to me because I'm going to be buying everybody at the store you know, the new Call of Duty or whatever. So I pull up to the <laughs> shop and I'd be like, all right, everybody in the store right now, come over here and whatever it would be, it'd be like 10 people at the store. I'm like, I'm buying everybody Call of Duty today. So come no on way. over, let me get it. I'm filming a video about this. It just kind of like went down that direction of being more of a, it was still gaming based, but it was real life like vlogging. And that, and that transition was relatively smooth. And honestly, it makes you more, because people always want to know more about like what's going on behind the scenes or Who's this guy? Just like you brought up Nate Shot. Nate Shot was only a, he was only a pro Call of Duty player, right? That's all he mm-hmm. was. And then he got so big that people became interested in what was going on with him. And now all he does is, you know, he does gaming live streams, but now he's known for like 100 Thieves. He's partnered with Drake. He does all this other like real life stuff with, with all the boys like Courage and Symphony and them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mental, isn't it? I think that... When they do show that other side to them, people are so interested. Like Nuke Squad done a lot of that sort of stuff for a while, didn't they? Like I don't know if they're still doing it, actually. I haven't checked in on a while, in a while, but they started doing like they moved into a house together, didn't mm-hmm. they? And was vlogging it all, and and that yeah. was pretty cool. I was in lockdown, mate. I watched a lot of them. Yeah, Nuke Squad's great. So you know Swag. Yeah, Swag. Yeah. So so Swag's he's another one of the guys that's been around forever. I think he was making videos in like 2012, and so me and Swag used to literally like split hotel rooms back in the day. I just saw him. Uh, relatively recently, maybe like six months ago, I went to the Nuke Squad house, was out there with them, but it's cool to see the 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 growth, right? Me and him went from splitting hotel rooms to now he he lived in a... Like his fucking house is huge. It, it was crazy, yeah. I think he lived in a place called Pacific Palisades or something. It's like a massive house. His, his neighbors are like NBA players and Post Malone and all these guys. Then they have like a um, like a basketball court in their, in their house at one point in mm-hmm. like you know, like a, a spare kind of house at the back of their house and just, right. you know, they just fucking, it's just, it's just a different world. And, and it, yeah, it's, all, it's just all crazy. All from playing watch, Call of Duty, it? right? All from playing all from Call of Duty, which is insane. Insane. So he's fucking, they are good, aren't they? Like Swag yeah. is fucking good. Oh, Swag's good. Yeah. He's always Booyah good. Booyah is fucking unbelievable, isn't he? Booyah is very good. Yeah, all those guys are like super good. And also, but like you said, it's not only that they were good, but also they were so interesting that they were able to make that transition and do all that stuff like with Nuke Squad and all that. Yeah, it's fucking, it blows my mind sometimes. Mate. I'm sorry, I think, because you always say you're very good at Call of Duty. Why, why aren't you living in a house? Because I'm not that, that good. All that interesting. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah, they are like ridiculous. I, I, I've never seen you play, mate, but you know, to be a pro, you must be fucking good. But like... I, <laughs> I wasn't that good. I only, I only played in the pro scene like... A handful of times i think i made like even five still grand. Mate, like come on like even just to even get that like like i said like i'm i'm okay for a dad you know what i mean like yeah. <laughs> playing a few hours a night i'm okay <laughs> i can hold my own for a jujitsu terminology i would say that i was like like purple belt in the call okay. of duty scene you know yeah. but everybody else was black belt so like ah yeah not that great yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. when you boys talk about like pro gaming yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit ignorant to all this stuff mate um is that like like tournaments where you get paid to win or is it earning money from like twitch and that type of thing i think it's a bit of a mix really isn't it because it is it is pro gaming like a lot like if you've got a war zone call of duty pro like a lot of them do um like competitions where they compete and they they earn money from it but then you got people like symphony for example i'd class him as a pro gamer but he's really just a streamer would you say that yeah, he's competed in the pro scene a little bit as well. Uh, I yeah, believe, but he doesn't do it very often, does he? Right, but he's more known for the entertainment side. So when I say, when I say pro gaming, I played in the actual competitive scene a little bit. But really, truthfully, I'm much more known for the entertainment side. And I I personally would consider it to like the outside world that's professional gaming because I made money from it. But to like people who actually play games, they don't really consider you pro unless you're playing in the competitive scene. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a bit of a kind of grey area, but yeah. yeah, like to the to the everyday person, if you if you watch any like Twitch and you're watching like I don't know Nick Max for example or Tim Tatman or whatever, they. they <laughs> Tim, maybe to exclude Tim, but <laughs> um, like <laughs> like Nick's very good at the game, and mm-hmm. and yeah, he's earning fuck tons of money off of being it. So he's he's technically a pro, you know. I mean? Yeah, I would consider anybody who's been, like it's he's doing it professionally as his job, right? Yeah. So I would definitely consider anybody who's making money, no matter how they're doing it from gaming, that's their professional career, right? So I think that for me, I look at it like that. But then you once you start getting into it, it's almost like when you're black belt in jujitsu, people are like, oh. Everybody on the outside is like, oh, he, wow, like he's professional, like he's a black belt, he's so good. But to us, we're like, unless you're competing and winning money, you're really not like a professional, professional, like jujitsu yeah. player. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, though, isn't it? It's like, it's like a different world out there, isn't it, with this mm-hmm. pro- professional gaming. So, with regards to your like, obviously, transition, and then you've got like your jujitsu along, uh, alongside that, do you get like, do you do it? Did you ever like vlog your jujitsu? Did you ever push that side of it? Or was that like a completely different side of your life that you kind of kept to yourself? Uh, it was definitely a different side that I, I didn't really vlog a lot of it. Def, definitely in my, um, in my vlogs, in my videos, there was times that I would include like maybe in, I'd be like, Hey, today we're going to go to GameStop before we go, I'm going to go train. And I'd, in, I'd include like little highlights of my training sessions but really mm-hmm. not too much. Unless you really knew me or you're a big fan, you wouldn't super know that I do jiu-jitsu yeah. or anything like that. But now since the since the dawn of the whole influencer boxing thing, since then everybody now knows that I'm black belt in jiu-jitsu because it's more directly correlated to the combat sports, uh, white collar, celebrity boxing stuff now. Because now whenever I'm like doing anything or people talk about me, they go, oh yeah, he boxed on Misfits and then he – helped with the Jake Paul's uh, stuff and he's black belt in jiu-jitsu. So now it gets brought up a lot more these days. Yeah, I can imagine. So with that, does it bring some added pressure now? Everyone knows you're a black belt. <laughs> and yeah, they come in yeah. and try and smash you. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. For, so like I just traveled, um, I've just been traveling the last few months and every time I, I hop in a gym and people find out I'm black belt, that's obviously one thing. And then they find out I uh, am involved in the influencer boxing world. So yeah, people definitely try to smash me. And then when it comes to the boxing side, uh, people will say, oh, he's a black belt. So instead of fighting an amateur, let's put him against the professional guys. Like one of the guys I fought, Faye Sensei, he was, uh, he was, you know who KSI is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was uh, KSI's coach in 2018. So he's coaching KSI for his fight. And then he couldn't find anybody to fight. So they put him against me. And they're like, oh, black belt jujitsu. At the time, I think I was like purple belt. He's like, oh, this guy's a jujitsu guy. So he can... He can definitely fight uh, Sensei. Meanwhile, Sensei, his whole family owns gyms, like uh, martial arts gyms. American Kempo is what he mainly does. But with the American Kempo, he's just kind of a student of martial arts. So he's been boxing since he was like four years old. So I'm like, all right, well, Jiu-Jitsu Purple Belt, boxing since you're four years old and we're doing a boxing match, there's no way that this is good for me at all. But to the outside well, they just think, oh, good at fighting, good at fighting. You guys fight. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going <laughs> to get beat up, but I guess. Well, it will be a bit fair, more fair if it was MMA, I guess. Oh, 100%. And we, we spoke I mean? about like, that. If it, was, if it was MMA, at least you could actually <laughs> you could control it. You know what I mean? You could use your jiu-jitsu, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would him, have but... at least somewhat of an answer, you know what I mean? So yeah. we we've uh, we talked back then, me and Faye Sensei were actually supposed to do a rematch in MMA for the next fight, but then the next fight didn't happen for a while. And now, so now fast forward five years, six years, now finally Misfits is coming out with MMA. It was supposed to happen earlier. It was supposed to happen actually late last year. It was going to happen um, uh, well, like two days before Christmas. We were going to do the first ever Misfits MMA. You're familiar with Misfits Boxing, right? KSI's company? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah. So they're going to do, um, they're branching out into MMA, and I was going to headline one of the cards uh, in an MMA fight. So finally... We got You're like, uh, yeah, MMA yes, coming. Like, fucking let's yeah, go. All right. <laughs> Finally, guys, it's been years. I've been waiting. So I'm just, I think it would be cool to, to um, A, to be able to showcase that skill set. And I've never actually had an MMA fight. I trained MMA. I used to teach at a UFC gym back in the day. So uh, finally, at some point, hopefully later this year, fall or winter, we're going to be doing that MMA match. And, and that should be a lot uh, more up my alley than the boxing was. Mm. Who you got your eye on, mate? Hmm. Well, I'd love to run it back with that face sensei rematch at some point. <laughs> that would be cool. He's retired, 
but I think he's only retired until something interesting happens, right? So mm, it's usually the case, yeah. That's always the case, right? I'm retired. Uh-huh. Oh wait, how much money? <laughs> I guess you? Yeah, let's do it. So the money's ridiculous for some of those fights, isn't it? Yeah. Ridiculous oh, yeah. for some of those fights. I mean, the guys at the top of the card that we all know and love, you know, those guys, the Paul Brothers, KSI, the big names are making millions of dollars a fight. The the names that are like somewhere in the middle, and I, I believe that a lot of this is public, but guys like Slim or Salt Poppy or these guys that are big in the influencer space, they're making six figures a fight. Fucking hell. I'd let someone chin me for six Which, figures. Just for the audience <laughs> sake, for comparison, right? Six figures a fight is something that you get if you're like a good UFC fighter that's been winning yeah, fights, right? Yeah, yeah, Generally, 100%. people come in and they're win- then they're getting like $10,000 to show and $10,000 mm-hmm. to win. So 20K is the maximum purse when you first enter the UFC, pretty much. And these guys are so known on social media and the money is so much that they can come in and make $150,000 for their first fight. It's, it's, it's insane, isn't it? But you've got these, these kids and these, these people that just look up to them and they sell, they sell out so fast, don't they? It's like the Sidemen charity matches and all that sort of stuff. That sells like faster than Man United games. It's just, it's just mind blowing, you know. My lad, he was like, "Dad, can we get tickets?" I was like, "Mate, there's no way I'll be able to get a ticket. I'd love to get you a ticket, but yeah. it just so I think it sold out in like twenty minutes." Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> my girl just left the room because I turned down the AC, and she's like, "It's so hot in here." I don't know if you guys know if you're familiar with Vegas <laughs> or how hot it is out here. I turned down my AC. Let me hold on. Let me let me tell you how hot it is. It is uh, 40, 49 degrees Celsius. Jesus. 49. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. So I don't know if you can hear this, but I have like a fan on over here. No, nah, we can't hear it. Okay, yeah. good. I turned it down as much as possible because it was like loud before because it was so hot. You know, in what, Vegas, she just like, come in and just like I'm, I'm fucking dying. Yeah, dude, my, my, my room's over here, and she just came out. And she was, she's like, I gotta go downstairs. It's so hot up here. I'm yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's toasty out there, man. I, I went there with a mate, I think, 2018, mm. and uh, we took the, the the typical tourist drive out to the Grand Canyon, and I had like a, uh, a car with a sort of roof off. And mate, fuck yeah, we were just getting absolutely baked. It's so hot there that the you know we got heated seats in the UK. Yeah. Mm. Out in out in Vegas, they got like cool seats. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The opposite. It gets so hot. And I'm gonna say two things. One, did you enjoy the Grand Canyon? Yeah, it was awesome, man. That's so. It's so. When you grow up somewhere, you get spoiled, you know. But I go to England a lot. Yeah. And thinking about your point of view when you came out here, that's probably like insane. Like I'm so used to it that I I've been like a few times. I'm like I don't really care. But then thinking about it from like an outside perspective, it, it's insane actually to like look at that landscape compared to anywhere else. We did the uh, we did the skywalk, mm. and fucking basically, man was crawling across it because I was so scared. <laughs> it basically goes out in a big like horseshoe, but it's got a glass yeah. floor. Right, okay. Fuck and mate, you, know. you when I was there, you can't comprehend how big it is. Like it's only when you look on the thing, and it's like like two or three Burj Khalifas on top of each other. It's fucking massive, and you, you, it's so big you can't see it. And I heard that this little buzzing noise, like a like a gnat or something. And I looked, and it was a fucking plane flying through the Grand Canyon. <laughs> but it looked, it looked like a little like fly. It was that big. It's just oh, so vast, yeah. mate. But unreal. Is it? Yeah, is yeah it? unbelievable. I've, yeah, I've, I've not been so. And then, and yeah, then that was it. the second thing I'm going to say is the heat is intense out here. Like I said, 49 degrees Celsius. Um, that's 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and Every day, I, I have a house right here on the Strip, so I live two minutes away from any casino out here. I literally leave my house, and I, two minutes, I'm in a casino, which is great. Uh, but every day that I go to the Strip, and I go to the Strip a lot, I go there to eat or to shop or whatever, like, frequently. Um, every single day, I see, during summer, I see no less than two people, like, getting pulled out in ambulances because of heat stroke or because they, they don't understand, like, you really can't be outside here for long periods of time. Uh. It's crazy. It's isn't it? I, th- I think because of the city, you, you forget you're in a desert, right? I think yeah. you're, you're kind of you're in you're in you're in Vegas on the Strip, mm. and it's obviously it's it's concrete and it's full of big buildings, but you're still in a desert. You're still in yeah. the Nevada desert. It's fucking yeah, it's yeah, crazy. It's mind blowing. It's nice. It? It's imagination land out here, but yeah, like you said, we're still in the desert. Yeah, man, I, I, it was it was cool. I, I I was surprised by the Strip. I think I underestimated how big the Strip was. Mm. It's obviously fucking ginormous, right? Yeah. And when I was walking around, because it's so big, it was quite like chilled. Um, and obviously, when you're in the casinos, it's different. But what was wild was Fremont Street. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you went. Yeah, Fremont. So when I go out with my friends, like local friends, that's where we go. 
It's wild. Well, what's what's what's? It's like the old. It's like the old strip, basically. Oh, is it? And it's Before like, it went massive. Yeah, but it's it's much smaller, and they've got like uh, they put a roof on it, so it's a street, but they've put a roof on it, and it's they've got all this this big screen like in the roof. Oh, nice. So you're there. I rocked up, and you've got like some dude playing at one end, like live, like fucking rock music. <laughs> You got like chicks with their boobs out, like serving beers. You got homeless guys getting kicked in the balls for money. You got zip lines going up like over the roof. It's just fucking wild, mate. It's absolutely wild. And when I got to the Fremont Street, I was like, okay, this is what I thought Vegas was like. Yeah, it's definitely Vegas is like so Fremont Street, there's a the regular strip that everybody thinks of, and then there's Fremont Street, which is almost like it's like a condensed version because it's much easier to walk up. It takes you like 15 minutes to walk up the street where the strip takes you maybe like an hour and 15 minutes to go walk yeah, yeah. up the whole street. And okay. so it's condensed. Yeah, it's massive. It's, yeah, it's very big, bro. And then, and, and that's the thing, like you're in good shape, so you're probably fine. But a lot of people, a lot of tourists come out here and they think, oh, you know, Vegas, they never seen anything like it or whatever. So they don't realize how big it is. And then they're out there walking. They're not drinking water. They're drinking a bunch of alcohol. These guys are like overheating. I'm not kidding when I say every, I could go out right now and I guarantee you within 10 minutes, I'll see somebody getting pulled away into the ambulance with like IVs because it's just so hot. And then they don't realize like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that I'm walking through the, because imagine walking through the, the hottest desert ever for an hour and a half. Like you're going to be drained. Yeah, it's it's it's, ma it's massive, mate. It's miles long. I, I, I fucking want to go, obviously. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Mate, you were telling us who your, uh, your ideal matchup was, mate, and then we interrupted you, I think. So you, you're saying about running it back with uh, the Sensei guy. Anybody yeah, so, else? Uh, sensei would be would be cool in the MMA. Um, there's a few other guys because like in the space, there's there's very few guys that have um, backgrounds in, in other sports. Uh, sports or martial arts besides boxing because obviously the boxing thing is so big that's where the money comes from so there's very few and far in between guys but they they actually had me set up against a guy named i don't know if we're still going to do this one it might have moved on but originally i was slated to fight brandon buckingham he was a uh, he wrestled from the time he was little until he was in college he's pretty decent wrestler in college and then he had uh one boxing match so we're similar there and so I was going to fight him. And now I don't know who I would fight, but I'd be down to pretty much fight anybody unless they're talking about me fighting like an actual UFC fighter and stuff, which once again, <laughs> you're putting me like in this position where it's like, guys, I'm, I'm a black belt in jujitsu. I wrestled a bit. I did some other martial arts. I've done like three months, four months of boxing in my whole life. So I'm really – give me an amateur. But then again, if I do fight a UFC fighter, that kind of – no matter what happens, that's pretty cool, you know. So you know, I'm pretty much down for whatever. That's class, yeah. That's, that must be crazy. It must be weird, a weird position to be in because, like you said, the money's so good. Like sometimes they get off you as someone that you don't really want to fight, but the money's fucking class. So you're like, wow. right? Like the face temper fight, they offered me one of my good friends, like one of my really good friends, on four days' notice, and I already knew that he was like, and we have we've sparred before, and I already knew kind of how it would go, and <laughs> I was not in shape for this or anything, and it's like. But the money was so good that it's like, all right, well, hop it in there. You know? I can get knocked out for this sort of yeah. cash. <laughs> right? I'm in, right? Yeah, and I don't blame you, mate. Tell us about your style of jiu-jitsu. And because you said, did you say you compete on the pro scene in jiu-jitsu for a little bit as well? I, I, I've competed in jiu-jitsu, not in the pro scene. So I okay. started back like that story about my dad watching UFC. Yeah, we yeah. went and we signed up at that UFC, or we went and signed up at an MMA gym. And back in the day, like everybody was still trying to convince Nobody really knew what jujitsu was because this was back in like probably 2006. So it wasn't mainstream like it is nowadays where pretty much everybody who's a fan of combat sports or even if you're not, you kind of know jujitsu. So I was signed up at that MMA gym. I was doing that and then I switched over to a um, purely jujitsu gym. And even back then, I remember guys, so many people would come in and go, oh, I thought there was, this was a karate school or I thought there was, this was Taekwondo. <laughs> and I remember my instructors even having people come in back in the day and challenge them to like to fights, you know, which is crazy. I don't know if this happened, if this was a, a phenomenon over in England, but out here in the US, uh, there was still the the Gracie challenge idea going around where people would come into the jujitsu gym and you know say, Hey, uh, I want to see if this really works. And I remember after class sometimes there'd only be a few guys allowed in the school, and my instructor would be fighting these guys like bare fisted to show them, oh, jujitsu is better than whatever it is, uh, the flavor of the day, Taekwondo, let me show you why. And like, go in, the guy's trying to kick my instructor, he takes him down, chokes him out. Um, it's it's like crazy. And I don't even know if this is like a public story, so I won't say any names, but I remember this one guy came in to challenge my instructor and he was like really like 
telling him like, I'm going to do whatever. Like I'm going to gouge your eyes. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And my instructor choked him unconscious, let the guy wake up. Uh, the guy kept attacking him, choked him unconscious again. <laughs> the guy got up, choked him unconscious for a third time. And then finally the guy's like, okay, this works. And up at the gym. I was like, this is insane. Like it was really like a, a blood sport back in the day. That's absolutely wild. You couldn't imagine that now, could you? No you couldn't way. imagine that now. Now everybody knows. I go to the gym now, and instead of killers in there, there's, like, a lot of kids that train. It's a family thing. It's, like, it's pretty – there's still, like, the hardcore guys that are there all the time. But um, it is funny to see the commercialization, to some degree, of jiu-jitsu because it's so mainstream now. And um, as far as competing, I, I did compete, like, a bunch back in the day when I was a uh, white belt, blue belt. Um, but then after that, I, I haven't competed since. And now – because I have some name value and stuff, I, I get offers. Like I just got an offer from the UFC to come compete for like 10K uh, on UFC Fight Pass. And for me, 10K is good, but it's not good enough for me to go compete because really I have like such interesting offers. For example, Dylan Dennis was supposed to fight KSI back before he fought Logan Paul. He was supposed to fight KSI last year in January. And then there was talks of, all right, well, after he fights KSI, We'll let him do like a jujitsu match with you for like you guys could do a no gi like jujitsu match just to showcase the the grappling aspect, and that never materialized. But uh, you know the offers like that are too good for me to take 10k offers. You know because I know that there's like you know 30k, 50k offers on the table um, if I just play the cards right. So I'm gonna compete again, but in the meantime I'm not I'm not gonna pay to go compete somewhere and then people have footage on me and all that. And as of right now, I train with really good guys. I train with a lot of people at UFC PI. Um, yesterday, I was training with um, a UFC fighter, and then I was training with uh, the number six guy uh, in the world at Black Belt in his division. So I, I train with really, like, pretty high-level guys. Uh, I've trained with both the Diaz brothers before. I've trained with, like, a lot of people. So I think that I get good enough training that uh, obviously competition is going to be a little bit different, but I really have a lot of faith in the people that I train with and the – the degree in which I train. I think that whenever I come out, I, I compete again for money, for a lot of money. Guys, please hit me up. <laughs> UFC, you know, let's increase that bag. Um, but once I do that, I, I have uh, confidence, you know. So interesting, isn't it? It's like a different weird world out there. And are these like, <laughs> these like, you know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because being a black belt, I can imagine like people do want you to compete, you know what I mean? Because you mm. are in the public eye as well. So they kind of just probably want to just see if you're, you know, fucking legit not legit whatever and it must be a weird feeling for you because again in jiu-jitsu like black belts here and then there's black belts up here and there's black belts up here in it so like fight pass especially like us like you said for 10k it's it's a big fucking risk isn't it yeah oh a hundred percent a hundred percent it is and that is true and i i travel so much so if you're ever interested in seeing if i'm good or not i travel so often i'm in different gyms all the time i i've trained with a lot of people that know who i am or whatever and it, it is kind of it's kind of nice to go from oh I knew you from gaming or oh you're not great at boxing to like oh this guy showed up at my jujitsu gym I'm gonna wrestle him and then you're like oh okay I'm semi legit at jujitsu which it's good to be good at something it feels good you know yeah mate it's 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 funny when you said about the the kind of old gym storming as well so despite the fact that I'm a brown but I probably first started jujitsu around 2006 as well. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of been in and out a little bit. And I think the UK scene was definitely very different to the US. Mm. I think because you had a lot of the Brazilians turning up, obviously trying to establish themselves. So you, you kind of had that, from what I gathered, that that kind of, that that, that almost like a tradition of, of gym storming mm. um, to, to kind of prove it. Whereas in the UK, I don't know, mate, I, I don't know if we call it even jujitsu. We had a few black belts. And eventually we had obviously uh, sort of Bradley or Steamer and, and Hodger and, and those guys come and settle in the UK. But certainly in the Southwest where me and Danny are from, there's very little scene. I didn't even know what jiu-jitsu was 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, it was... I didn't even know what it was. I thought it was like some gay karate yeah. or something. Like that. I mean, you're right. You're right. It I is. didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. But when you said that people would, would ask you if it was karate, that definitely happened all the fucking time. Yeah. That happened all the time. My wife still takes a piss out of me a little bit. Not in a thing way, but I, there used to be a guy that used to do maybe jujitsu or something that where my lad used to go football. And I used to call him like Sensei Craig and shit. I used to be like, oh, look at Sensei Craig now. And now knowing what I know, like Sensei Craig would fucking rape me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> and I say right. that to her. And now she calls me Sensei Craig when I put my gear on. And I'm like, wow. Oh, that's what that's it is, so isn't funny. It? You know what? I honestly. I actually have a little funny jujitsu story for you that you might um, 
you might enjoy. Uh, I'm not going to say any names once again, because <laughs> these people are public figures to some degree. I was out with a bunch of guys. We're filming. Uh, we went to a nightclub and we got recognized. So the manager sent us over like a few extra bottles of uh, like vodka and tequila and stuff. And so we all ended up drinking, drinking a lot, probably more than probably more than I should. But I know that you you K boys are a different a different breed when it comes to that. But for me, it was too <laughs> We're much. Binges, mate. We're binges. <laughs> you really are, guys. But <laughs> <laughs> but we went out. We we went to this club, drank a lot, left the club. I immediately. I'm not really a big throw up guy. I immediately threw up after we exited the club. I waited until we got outside, though. You know, good guy, gentleman, classy, 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 classy guy. You know, <laughs> threw up outside. Get in the car. We're driving back. It's like a 20 minute drive. We have cameramen with us. We got a couple like famous guys, and these guys, um, you know, they compete in the in the celebrity boxing world. And the two of the guys that are in the car don't like each other because they're planning on fighting in a couple months. But you know, when we're all out, we all know each other, so whatever, cordial. Uh, they start arguing in the car. They pull over. Everybody starts getting in this like altercation. And meanwhile, to me, not to be big headed, but I'm really like, I'm the only like real fighter of the bunch, I would say, because I actually have been training forever. It hasn't just been like a new thing where I just started boxing a year ago or whatever. I've been doing jiu-jitsu for years and years. So these guys are all getting like a little bit in each other's faces. And one of the guys punches, one of the guys punches one of the cameramen. And I'm like, okay, all right. The cameraman's just like, honestly, he's just a small English guy. Like, don't hit him. <laughs> so I take this guy down. I put him in a head and arm choke. But instead of the arm being up here, I kind of put it across him. But that's how we got stuck, you know. So he's stuck here. I'm on top of him. And I'm like, I'm like cinched down, gable grip on top of him, head and arm choke. He's freaking out. He's hitting me in the ribs. Um, he's like, let me up. Uh, like, getting crazy, getting wild. I'm like, listen, man. And I'm holding this man down for what felt like forever to me. I, meanwhile, I'm drunk. I had just thrown up. So it probably felt like it felt like six <laughs> minutes. It was probably like 30 seconds. You know, I'm holding him down. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, I get it. You're boxing. You're tough. You're a tough guy. But I could do anything I want to you right now. You need to relax. He's like freaking out. And so just and I, and I know the guy. He's, he's a friend of mine. So to kind of hit him with a stun grenade, you know, flashbang him a little bit, maybe distract him. I'm like. I go to kiss him like on the head, right? I kiss him on the forehead. I'm like, look, I just kissed you, buddy. I can, I can do whatever I want to. You're stuck. And he starts freaking out like this. I go to kiss him like just again on the cheek just to freak him out, make him stop. You know, I go, he's thrashing. I go to kiss him on the cheek. I get lips. I'm just, I just, <laughs> yeah. Ended up being only a kiss on the lips. And he was like, oh my God, why would you, why would you do that? Fine, put me back in the car. So I put him back in the car. So it worked, right? It obviously worked. Put him back in the car. We go back to the hotel. Uh, a bunch of us are like splitting rooms because there's only so many available. So instead of him staying in the room, he slept in the vending machine room, which I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but out here we got the ice machine, the vending machine. It's hot in there. He slept in this little tiny vending machine room the whole night. And then the next day, everything was good again. But it's nice to know jujitsu for stuff like that. You know, I love holding down my friends and kissing them. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, though, because people don't realize the amount of control. Like even, you know, especially as a black belt, but fucking hell, like you can, you can manipulate someone so easily. Yeah. Especially it's like it's like Gordon Ryan says, like a, a, they, 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 they come in and they just don't have a clue of how to use their body. And yeah. you just oh, know, like so just don't realize. Or, they just don't realize. They don't realize until they come in. They come in once and they're like, fuck. You know like, I mean? And not, not even like a blue belt, because a blue belt, I would say, is more than capable of handle, handling most of the population, right? But even a guy who's been training for six months, if you got a stripe on your white belt, two stripes on your white belt, that's like your head and shoulders above most people you're going to run into just because you have an idea of like, this is good or this is bad, right? And yeah. you deal with somebody in the street, sometimes they'll you know, the classic, like, put you in a headlock and then they don't care about their base or leg positioning. It's like, oh, put me in a headlock. This is great <laughs> for me. This is actually a good position, <laughs> you know? Yeah, mate. It is good. But, mate, in that situation, exactly, like, drunk, pissed up, round with your mates. I've been in situations as well. And if you didn't know jujitsu, it just ends up in a punch up. And then yeah. that's the, the fallout for that the next day is a whole different story than just kissing somebody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Be, be, imagine that. Imagine if I was only like, imagine if I had only been like, oh, I'm a Muay Thai guy, which is great. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, that's, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then my friend wakes up and he's all lumpy and he's mad at me. Instead, <laughs> the next day we woke up and we, we were all at breakfast together. Everybody's cool now. And one of the cameramen was like, yo, you're they're like over. It. You're insane. You held this man down last night and kissed him. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> I, that that worked out so much better than if I just like 
head kicked somebody, you know? And then yeah, nah. the, the thing about the kiss too that I want to emphasize is that when I did kiss him, it was like six minutes after I had thrown up. So for sure it was not a pleasant <laughs> kiss. You know, you know? <laughs> Stinking. <laughs> yeah, not good. Not good. All of my beard, not good. So um, what, what gym did you train at? Uh, I trained at the Gracie who might the gym out here. And then I trained with a bunch of the boys from the UFC PI. That's cool, isn't it? That's cool. Yeah, some good gyms some, in Vegas. Yeah, I was about to say, some really yeah. good gyms. Oh, for is sure. There, is Strickland out there? He was out yeah, there. Yeah, he, So he trains. Has he beat uh, you up yet? Has he chinged you yet? No, I was actually supposed to train with him a couple times. He's uh, <laughs> one of my really Fuck good that. friends. So, okay, yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> I was supposed to train with him. And then, because uh, he, one of my really good friends and, and a black belt that uh, was one of my instructors is his like favorite training partner. So I got invited to train with him a, a bunch of times. And then. All those clips of him beating the absolute dog water out of his training partners came out. Mm. So I was like, oh, it's probably good that I didn't train with him, actually. And now, would I train with him? Sure. But it would have to be, like, filmed for content and I'd get beat up. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when you say train, would you would you roll or would you box with him as well? Um, if, I was, if I was training, like, once I start training... To be honest, I probably will train with him once an MMA fight is coming up because I'm going to make yeah, the yeah. runs. Uh, Max Holloway invited me to train with him. Uh, obviously, yeah. I can go train with Sean Strickland. All the UFC fighters are based out here, so I will train with a bunch of them. Uh, but right now, if I was to train, because I'm not in camp for anything, I would prefer just to go do some grappling. Yeah, it makes sense, man. No, that would be sensible. I saw what he did to Sneeko, mate. So, oh, no. uh, yeah, that was yeah. fucking crazy, wasn't it? Was, oh, was it you know wasn't what? he talking shit, though? Was he talking shit to him and then he just yeah, beat him up? I think that... I don't know if Sneaker was talking as much like to Sean as as he was just talking on the internet, and so I right. think that Sean just wanted to a prove a point, um, and b at least it was viral, so that's good. And props to Sneeko for standing up. Everybody's like, "Oh, yeah, Sean man. wasn't going hard." Right. Uh, yeah. Sean was going hard, you know. And yeah. they, I think that a few more seconds of that, Sneeko would have dropped. But props to him for massive respect to him for being able to withstand that and not just go down because i think that most people would you know and that mm. shows a lot of good heart and speaking of sneaker i actually was um i actually was uh in the talks they had hit me up because i was supposed to fight sneaker on uh one of these boxing match matches i don't know if we were going to do it in dubai or whatever but they actually had contacted me to fight him so i have like all the the emails and stuff from like hey we have this fight with you we want it lined up with sneaker blah 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 and so i accepted but it never happened oh god that yeah. would be cool yeah, what was it like training with the Diaz brothers? Very good, very good. Those guys, oh, I have a good story actually about that as well. <laughs> um, it was good. Those guys are very, very good at jujitsu. Uh, they train out here a lot. I should be training with them again relatively soon because I'm friends with Jake Shields, who's a mm -hmm. big UFC guy, friends with yeah, them. Yeah. I see him all the time. Uh, my friends train with him like once a week, so I'm sure that I'll run into them again. But I see the Diaz brothers out a lot, I especially see Nick. We go to the same nightclub a lot, so I see him all the time. Um, Nate Diaz. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, with him choking out the fake Logan Paul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What was that about? Because because oh. I've seen you with him quite a lot, haven't you? So is he your friend? So let me tell you, <laughs> him getting choked out was completely and one hundred percent my fault. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No way. Okay, so quick rundown. We're at a Misfits boxing event out in New Orleans. Uh, fake Logan Paul shows up. I had known him through online. It was our first time meeting in person. Great guy. Literally the nicest guy. So regardless of, I'm going to tell you right now, regardless of what you've seen on the internet, fake Logan Paul was only trying to split up the fight. He wasn't trying to fight Nate Diaz. He was, I know I see, I see the, the skeptical hippo eyes from Brown Belt <laughs> Paul over here. I'm telling you for a fact, the nicest guy. I'm going to break down the video for you guys. Pull up the video, Jamie. Awesome. Good. I don't know if you guys do that, but, <laughs> but, um, we're out. We're at the event. At the event, Nate Diaz's guy, Chris Avila, if you're familiar with him, uh, that's one of Nate Diaz's friends, training partners. He was fighting one of our guys from Misfits. Uh, in the boxing fight, Nate Diaz got in an altercation with a guy named Chase Damore. Chase Damore is a reality show star. He fights on Misfits. He got in an argument with Nate Diaz. It started a little riot. Uh, everything, security came, broke it up. Police came, broke it up. Everything's fine. Later that night, we're all out on Bourbon Street, which is the main street in New Orleans. We're out drinking all that. I'm familiar with Nate Diaz. The, literally, like, two months before th that altercation happened, that fight night, I was with Nate Diaz. We had a table together out in Vegas. So, like, 
he had bought me a bottle. We're all cool. Everything's good. Uh, so he he's familiar with me. We've been out before. Uh, and we're so we're walking down the street. And we had just been out in New Orleans the night before as well. So we're walking down the street. I'm with all the influencers from Misfits. I'm with Chase Damore, fake Logan Paul, and maybe like a dozen other guys. I'm walking and I see... Uh, I see uh, one of Nate Diaz's guys. His, his name's uh, Killshot. I don't know his actual name, but his fighter name is Killshot. You can imagine, kind of a rough guy. He sees me, and he's like, oh, what's good over it? How are you? What's up? I go up. I give him a hug. Uh, I don't even think that – I don't even think about the fact that Nate got in a fight with Chase Demore earlier. I don't even think about it because I'm, I'm like, very friendly guy. I'm friendly with everybody. So I'm just like, oh, it's great to see you. Killshot goes, oh. Nate's inside. Go say what's up to him. I'm like, oh, yeah, for sure. I go into the bar, and all these bars are like kind of street bars. Like, you get a, get a drink at the street. You don't even really have to go all the way inside. So I see Nate. I go up. I'm like, oh, what's good, Nate? Give him a hug. I turn around, and Killshot is arguing with Chase Damore. And just a full-fledged brawl starts taking place with, like, ten guys. I don't know if you guys seen the clips. Like, I'm sure you've seen fake Logan yeah, Paul getting yeah, choked out. Yeah, yeah. But there's, like, a dozen other guys fighting, like, in the vicinity. So all this stuff is happening. Uh, I, at one point I'm like, I'm like friends with everybody. So I'm like, Oh guys, why? Like I'm like the third wheel right at this party. I'm like, please guys stop. <laughs> and I'm like looking around and just random groups, random people from Nate Diaz's team are just punching random people from the influencer squad. And like at one point, one of Nate Diaz's guys, his coach specifically comes up, pushes my shoulder to the side and puts his fist back like this and looks at me. And I'm like, He's like, no. <laughs> and then he like looks at me. He's like, oh, yeah, you're good. And then he turns and starts fighting <laughs> somebody else. I'm like, oh, like, that was scary. But fake Logan Paul is like, Nate Diaz kind of circles the group. All his friends are fighting. Fake Logan Paul is completely unfamiliar with social media and the space. He only got involved because Logan Paul saw him and reached out to him. He didn't <laughs> like, he didn't know who Logan Paul He's like 40, has a family. He just happened to be posting TikTok videos and Logan Paul was like, oh, you look like me. Fly out to here. So he only recently got involved with social media. So the only people that he knew was me, Chase Damore, and Nate Diaz because he realized, oh, they got in a fight earlier. I should split them up. Chase Damore at this time was getting beat up by like three guys. So his name's Rodney. Rodney, fake Logan Paul, runs over to where Nate Diaz is. He's like, I'm a fan. Please stop, Nate. Don't fight Chase Damore. <laughs> Don't do it. And then in the video, you can see him. And I'll say this. He shouldn't have approached him at all because of the circumstance. Don't even approach where he's at. But in the video, you see him hands up like this. He's like, hey, Nate, please don't choke me unconscious in front of all my <laughs> friends. I'm a big fan, you know. And then if you actually watch the video, one of Nate Diaz's boys actually bumps into him in the like in the back of him, bumps into him. And so he's not he doesn't walk forward. He gets pushed a little forward like this. <laughs> oh, no. Which is like comedy, just, man. Oh, man. No, it's just a bad situation. It's a bad circumstance, a fortunate circumstance. I would have never personally ran up to Nate Diaz, but he's close. He gets pushed. And right here is when Nate Diaz pulls him into the into the guillotine. And then if you watch <laughs> the video, fruit as well, bro, it's the, it's the <laughs> it could possibly be the worst hangman guillotine I've ever seen in my life, bro. Oh, mate, he like, fucking him, like proper locked and, it. Bro, and then he gets punched in the – I think Nate Diaz knees him in the ribs like twice. And then one of Nate Diaz's boys comes over and punches him in the same spot in the ribs. And then another one of his boys comes over and punches him again in the same spot. Oh, bro. no, man. And then Poor he guy. drops him. And, like, I think that to the to the to untrained eye, you might say, oh, he let him down gently. He just dropped him. But for all of us, you know that if somebody's unconscious and you – even if you let them down gently, even if they fell from six inches onto concrete, it's going to be bad. He actually fell from like two, three feet. So he had like a massive um, cut on the back of his head. Super like his whole shirt was drenched in blood. I have videos from afterwards too. All bloody. He had a concussion. We got him in. The, I actually got him in the ambulance and put him and got him to the hospital. And this man was super concussed. He dealt with concussion symptoms for like six months. It was crazy. So I would no say, way. did he deserve it? Because I know his intention. I don't think that he did. But because of the circumstance, it... um. Just does, naive. Yeah, he's just naive. He didn't know the space. He He's just like, yeah. So I think that he's a good guy trying to do the right thing. But in that situation, the right thing for him would have been to just let it all play out and back off, to be honest. Because like me, I'm <laughs> Jiu-Jitsu Black Belt. I'm relatively tough, kind of. And I was like, ah, you guys handle it, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah. Fucking poor guy, mate. Just some random dad, basically. I bet he's just gone home, oh, shaved man. his head, yeah. just I'm closed, not, not his, just closed his laptop <laughs> and just never want to be seen ever again. <laughs> this social media thing is not for me. Yeah. Just shuts the laptop, yeah. yeah. Fuck, man, what was he like the next couple of days? Like, What did he say about the whole situation? Bro, he honestly, he doesn't that remember up, anything. Yeah. Oh, bro, it was number 17 trending on Google the next day. <laughs> Number seven, you know, there's billions of Google searches a day. And we were number seven. There was a video of me and him, and it was number 17 trending, which is crazy. So, yeah, but great guy, great guy. Didn't deserve it, you know. But now I think that they're okay. They're cool, you know. I What's think. he doing now? Is he, is he like, is he still pretending to be Logan Paul? I don't know. Like, yeah. what, what, is he making loads of fucking dough off it, I hope? Yeah, he, made, he makes decent money off of it. Um, I think that he made six figures in the last year off of it, which is good. <laughs> fucking that is wild, isn't, isn't it? Isn't that crazy? And then he's boxed on Misfits, and uh, he's fought a couple times since in boxing matches. I think he he won two, and he lost one. So he's been, like, making a name for himself, and he still is, like, tight with Logan Paul and all that. Uh, so, yeah, everything's been going good for him besides the... <laughs> Besides that, and that I mean, honestly, if I could trade out being choked unconscious, like if it could have been me, I would have done that because it made him go very viral. So that's like all publicity is good publicity. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. There you go, mate. This is all you need to do when, when over, like as his Misfits match. Yeah. Fights the UFC there, blows up. You can just be fake over. Yeah, I'd just be fake Perfect. over. Yeah, I'd just come in yeah. and I would just be like, da yeah, check Danny, me out, bitch. <laughs> Danny, do this for me, Danny. Grow your beard out slightly, you know, <laughs> and then come do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fucking amazing. That is amazing. It's funny though, isn't it? It's, it's so, it's so, it, it, does it feel kind of surreal for you like to be in this crazy YouTube kind of world with all these different personalities and egos and characters because a lot of these guys are way out there, way out there and you seem really like kind of fucking normal, you know, but some of yeah. these guys are really like ego driven and you know, what's that like? Uh, I think that I'm, I'm uh, I, uh, I've grown up around it so much, you know, I started doing YouTube when I was like 18. So I've grown up around so many of these people that it, it is, it's pretty normal to me, to be honest. I have connections. I'm probably one of the most well-connected guys in the industry. Like I could call, I'm probably one of the more under the radar famous guys, I think, where like I have connections, everybody, everybody kind of knows me in the space. Um, but I really do come from like the professional gaming side as well. So I am a little bit more, maybe more, maybe more laid back to some degree. Uh, but it is, it is surreal. Like knowing that, like I was just with Conor McGregor in Ireland. You know, which is sick. Yeah, that was so, wild. I, I forgot to ask you about that. I've seen you with all the photos and stuff. What was all that about? Yeah, so I was out in um, I was out for a Misfits event. And then I went to Ireland for like a little vacation with my girl. And one of my friends, Keith Burke, he's he trains at Connor's gym. And then I believe that he's like the tattoo artist for the gym as well. And so I'm not sure if he's done Connor's work, but he does like all his guys work. So I'm friends with him. He wants to fight on Misfits. Uh, I'm a connection to Misfits, and then I run Happy Punch, so I'm like uh, a big guy in the space. So we connect, and we're friends. He takes me um, out in Ireland. He shows me around. He's like, let's finish the night. Let's go to Connor's Pub. Uh, I think that he should be there tonight. So we go over there, and uh, one of the guys that is signed to Happy Punch is a kid named Ben Williams. He's like a big up-and-coming uh, prospect out of out of Ireland, and he's uh, – He's, I don't know how close he is with Connor, but much closer than everybody else. He trains at Connor's gym and, you know, they follow each other. Connor posts some of his uh, fight footage sometimes and all that. So this kid is like maybe 21 years old and he's uh, super tight with Connor. And then his mom actually works at Connor's pub as well. So I went there to see him and his mom and kind of do that because, like, obviously he signed a happy punch. He's one of my fighters. So it's, it's good to see him. Uh, we go there and. Uh, we eat there, we drink a bit, and then Connor's there. He had like a meeting in the back, and I don't know if you know this, but I believe that the upstairs, or I know that the upstairs of that is like Connor's little. He has like an I don't know an apartment up there or something. Like he kind of has his own little place above the pub where he like lives sometimes, I guess. Um, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure that that's public information. If not, Connor, please don't beat me up. Uh, but I think <laughs> anybody could guess. There's an upstairs. Sometimes Connor's at his pub. Yeah, great guys. So uh, we're there. And as Connor is leaving his meeting, he's taking pictures with everybody. And then he sees my friend Keith. So he comes over and we just talk for like not even a long time, maybe like 90 seconds or something. So just got to meet him, mingle with him, talk to him a little bit about Misfits, uh, about KSI, about Ben Williams. Just like a little, little talk like that. Uh, told him I'm a massive fan since uh, he entered the UFC and, 
really, it was good. It was honestly a very cool moment. So that's pretty much it. But if you look at the pictures, it looks like I talked to him for like 10 minutes, really 90 <laughs> seconds. But to me, <laughs> you know, it, it was priceless. Yeah, I can imagine. It must be just cool to be around him. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Did I tell you that my uh, my work colleague grew up with Connor? Yeah, he did. He is yeah, 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 yeah. He said that. So I've got a uh, I've got a, a, a lad that I work with in London, mm-hmm. and uh, he's an Irish lad. And I've worked with him for about two years, and somehow I found that he'd done a bit of MMA in Ireland. So I asked him if he trained with Connor, and he grew up with Connor. So we lived around the corner with him, played at the same football team, mm-hmm. and I asked him what Connor was like growing up, and he said he's literally been the same. So they used to play football or soccer. And he used to say that uh, one of the things that Connor would do is he'd arrive early at the football game and he'd like walk down the touchline of the opposition while the opposition were warming up. And Connor was a striker, so he'd be playing against the defenders, like the number five from number three. And he'd go up to uh, all the people and say, "Oh, do you, do you know the number five? And they go, "Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know it's Joseph or whatever." And he goes, oh, is it, is, is, "Has he got a sister? He's got a sister, I think." Yeah, yeah, Mary. And he'd get all this information, all this intel, and then he was on the pitch. He'd be against this guy and go, oh, it's Joseph, right? And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know, I know your sister Mary. Yeah, I shagged her last night and it's <laughs> like getting in his ear oh, and just man. like wind these guys up and then just rinse them on the football pitch. Yeah, but I think uh, that's what he was notorious for. Me- mental warfare. That's good. But that's so, that's a hilarious thing. I thought this was going a different way. Like, oh, yeah, I know your sister. Like, we're cool. You know, everything's friendly. And then he'd <laughs> nah, score nah. on them. But no, it wasn't. It was that's not an Irish so way, funny. mate. That's not the Irish or English way either. You're you're right. I should have known you guys. <laughs> so I think even as a child playing football, he was he's he's always been the same. I think he's a he's a fucking madman. That's funny. And then you know what? I like the interview where I think his parents had said something like, "Oh, he was always like such a shy kid, or he's a good boy," you know. And then it's like, yeah, to your parents maybe, but then you you know you start actually succeeding and doing things, and then you got to. Bring out whatever personality you actually have. You kind of got to show it to the world, right? Instead of the personality that you have, maybe just with your boys in private. It's like this is the entertainment industry. So your your kid Connor maybe is a nice boy to you, but to everybody else, he's shagging their sister at the soccer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, he's a madman. Mate, tell us about Happy Punch because I'm not familiar with what that is that you do. Okay, so um, Happy Punch. With uh, the the onset of the influencer boxing back in twenty uh, back in 2021, 2022, uh, when things started rumbling and Jake Paul was still fighting, and you know, all basically in twenty eighteen when the first influencer fight happened in Manchester, all these guys it was supposed to be like a one off. So we did the fight, and then for years, really nobody there was no big influencer fights, right? There was the the first KSI versus Logan Paul, uh, Jake Paul versus Deji, and then the next year there was Logan Paul versus KSI two. And then after that, there was really nothing, no big noise, right? Jake Paul fought, and he continued fighting a couple times a year or whatever. But really, it wasn't like the massive spectacle that it was in 2018. Um, And then fast forward a few years, KSI comes out with Misfits. Jake Paul's still fighting. This whole thing gets geared up to where there's going to be more influencer fights. It's going to become a real thing. So uh, Keemstar and Fousey uh, developed Happy Punch, which is essentially it was only supposed to be like the I don't know what it was only supposed to be. Actually, let me let me say that it was. It's just supposed to be a team slash news outlet, like a social media team, same as like any other, like same as Sidemen, basically, right? We wanted to get the best guys in the influencer space, sign fighters, put out news about that. So it's kind of like a a, a mix of a, a few different things, but that was developed. Fuzi stepped back like almost immediately, so Keemstar was leading the whole thing by himself. Uh, he brought me in. Uh, because I had a Call of Duty team with him back in the day, and also I've been friends with Keem for like over a decade. So brought me in, and we started signing talent. So like a lot of the big guys that fight on Misfits, a lot of the big guys that are in the influencer scene, they're Happy Punch fighters. They're all signed to Happy Punch. The first like handful of Misfits events, uh, they weren't just Misfits events. If you go back and you look, they were Misfits Happy Punch events. So we were partners with Misfits, uh, we put all our fighters on Misfits. We did all the promo for them. So we're ba- basically like the promotional arm of the influencer boxing world. And even now we're doing like half a billion views a month on Happy Punch, making us like the biggest in the space for combat sports, which is awesome. So I think that the best way I would describe it is we're almost like, you know, the the Avengers. <laughs> we're like the yeah. Avengers of the influencer boxing world, right? We're just basically like a super team that also puts out you know, the, the news and media, we do like Twitter spaces and podcasts 
and um, the promotional stuff for all things combat sports, especially in the influencer world, would be my best description of it. Yeah, mate. That sounds fucking awesome, man. And when you say combat sports, is is it just primarily like uh, sort of striking sports or do you get involved with like jujitsu? Like, have you got thoughts on, I don't know, like CJI and ADCC and that sort of stuff? So we, we haven't really done anything and I would like to lead more into that area. I have some uh, deals on the rise for that. But basically, we were covering only influencer boxing. And then a few mm -hmm. months ago, we switched to covering all combat sports. Mm -hmm. um, so we went from influencer boxing to covering, obviously, like professional boxing and UFC and MMA now. So now we pretty much anything that's combat sports based, we cover that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. What are your, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the fight tomorrow with uh, Jake and, and Mike Perry? When does this episode come out? Uh, it's going to be probably a few weeks, mate. So it's going to be after. a few weeks. Okay. Okay. So as of right now, as of people watching this, Mike Perry versus Jake Paul is done. And we all know that Jake Paul got the victory in the seventh round or Mike <laughs> Perry KO'd him in the second round. I don't know. But uh, so I'm, I'm in a weird position with this, right? Cause like, so for me to break it down, honestly, um, I'm actually good friends with Mike Perry, uh, which is funny. It actually happened because Mike Perry is good friends with my dad because he met my okay. dad in Las Vegas at a convention. And so he loves my dad. So like my dad called me one day and he goes, Pat, I'm hanging out with this guy named Mike Perry. Do you know who he is? I was like, <laughs> yeah, he's like a UFC fighter at the time. He's like, come on down to the convention center. Come meet him. He's been hanging out all day. And I go down there and it's like the most boring convention ever it was for floors. It was for like, like literally like carpets and stuff. And my dad's a massage <laughs> therapist. So one of the, one of the companies hired his, his, uh, one of the companies at the convention hired my dad's company and a bunch of therapists to go out to the event and like massage their like high level customers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I go down there and Mike Perry's just hanging out with my dad and he's like, yeah, everybody here is boring, but your dad was really cool. So I, I came over here. I just been hanging out with him all day. I'm like, uh, all right. So since then, that was like four years ago. So I've been friends with him since then. Um, and I think that obviously he's done great work. Bare knuckle boxing was built for Mike Perry, to be honest. Like it's so perfect oh, for him. him. It's like, yeah. bro, it's so perfect for Mike Perry. It's crazy that like people are like, he was good at UFC. He's good at MMA, but then he goes to bare knuckle and he's like the best in the world. at it. it's like so funny how like that little he's just hard as fuck, mate. And he? he's yeah. just, oh, he's he really just is. an animal, mate. You watch him. I watched some of those bare knuckle FC fights and I, I, mate, I'm just wincing. I'm like, Oh my God. God, who the fuck would put themselves through that? You know what I mean? It's crazy because even like the toughest guys, like Luke Rockhold or Tiago Alves yeah. or whatever, even the toughest guys are not tough compared to Mike Perry in the sport of bare knuckle. Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah, he's just it, fucking. It's it's mad, isn't it? Well, it's just it, he is just genuinely like the hardest fucker around, isn't he? Yeah. So it's it is it. There's no hiding from it. Getting punched bare knuckle in the face. And being able to take that is just, it's just it's, a different, it's a different level. It's a different level, isn't it? It's just a different level. It must hurt so much more. You know, obviously you still get knocked out, but the gloves obviously take so much off. And then, you know, you're more likely to get knocked out, you know, in a UFC glove and then bare knuckle, you just cut. You've seen them, yeah. like, they're just fucking cut everywhere, aren't they? It's, it, you know, it's insane. And I'm so happy to see that he has been so successful in that. Um, and, and that being said, so I'm close with Mike Perry. I honestly, I was just with him. Like every time I see him, we hang out. Like if I go to an event and he's there, I hang out with him all night. Like, which is, a, is very cool, you know? And I just saw him a couple months ago. Um, and as far as Jake Paul is concerned, I know Jake. I've met him like once, maybe twice, but really I, I know his management. So I'm cool with his management, you know? Um, and I'd be, if I'm being totally unbiased about my thought process on the fight, I think that Mike Perry is great. I think he's very good, but it's really hard to beat somebody who's specialized in purely boxing, which is the sport that they're competing in. So I think that Jake Paul definitely has the edge in size, in the amount of time spent training. I think Jake Paul has the has the advantage. And that being said, I think Mike Perry is probably going to be, or he's definitely going to be the toughest guy that Jake has fought, but I don't know if he's going to be the most skillful in boxing, you know? Mm. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I get that. I guess, I guess toughest maybe sort of a close, a close first to, ahead of uh, Nate, right? Because Nate's Nate is a tough, badass yeah. as well, you know. So he's he's fought a couple of tough guys. Do you think if uh, if Mike does come unstuck, do you think it does any harm to his career in bare knuckle, or do you not think it matters? 
I, I don't think that it does. You know what? The thing is, he, it's a different sport. And maybe from the outside, people uh, might say, well, they're both boxing. But one of them is so different. It's basically like difference between like gi jiu-jitsu and no gi jiu-jitsu, right? Mm. So it's like you could be the best in the world at one. But no gi is, even though it's the same, it's still so massively different that, uh, you know, the guy who specializes in that specific branch of the sport is going to be better. Typically. Well, Jake's never going to step into a ring and bare knuckle with him. Oh, he? no, there's no way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's never. So it... There's no amount of money either that could probably bring him over, you know? No. A no. billion yeah. dollars, maybe. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. And I guess I guess Mike's just going to go back to bare knuckle and keep winning, isn't he? So yeah. even if it does tarnish his name, we'll soon get it back after knocking out a few people. So uh, yeah. You wonder your lifespan, though, with doing bare knuckle for too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't you? The you paychecks know, you are crazy, about... though. The numbers, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard some of the numbers from bare knuckle. is like... I, I didn't. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't really looked into it. Yeah. Like obviously, Connor's Connor's running it now, isn't he? Well, he's yeah, yeah. It. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. now they're probably gonna be even better, actually. But yeah, I, yeah, all those big guys that come over and fight from UFC are getting seven figure paychecks. You know, fuck, yeah. fucking hell, that's a huge payday, and especially for some UFC fighters, yeah. who are like getting just, fuck all compared to that. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? I just, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about the business and how much money they actually generate. I just. You always wonder if they're paying like massive purses, whether as a business that's going to just last long term. I don't know. Well, I think sometimes you got to the risk, right? And the reward. Oh, yeah. Like, of course, I think that yeah. you hear David Feldman's story, and he's like, I think that he did something like just recently, too, like in the last year or something, where he uh, got, he took money out of his house to be able to pay the fighters, you know, because he didn't have the actual funds. But look at what that turned into. It turned into like, um, all this other stuff and all these big investors coming in and Connor coming in and now they do mm -hmm. have, you know, he put all his money into it, yeah, taking a gamble that it would pay off and it it has been so it's yeah, crazy. Well, you hear that from Dana as well when early early UFC stuff he, he mm. put his own money in skin you know he had fucking creditors well, all sorts of stuff. He, he put the Fatia's money in yeah. and had so it's not quite the same but yeah yeah but no I think I, I saw Connor's uh, I saw their press conference I think yesterday or today whenever it was mm. and. Um, Connor made a good point that he doesn't get involved with stuff that he typically lets fail. You know what I mean? So I think he's going to, you know, I think he's going to work very hard to make it a success and he typically turns things to gold when he touches them. So straight away though, even him going across, it's made me watch it more yeah. just to see what's happening and just, you know, it just, it just pops up on your phone more, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Scrolling oh, for course, Instagram, right? It's like Connor McGregor talking at Bad Knuckle FC and, and before I never would get that, you know? Yeah. What do you make of a power slap as a sport? Um, yeah, it's so, big in Vegas, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I've been to a few. I've worked with them a few times. I'll say that, um, God, I just don't know how it's like, I just don't know how much of a sport it really is, to be honest, you know, because it is the training for it. I just, I just can't wrap my mind around the training for it. Besides like, you're going to train how hard you're going to get a hit or train how hard you can hit. But I don't know how you train <laughs> how hard you get hit, right? Because everything else you can avoid. <laughs> But it's really like you're just taking 100% damage that I just – I just – I okay, so I just – power slap, I love you. I just don't know how to wrap my mind around the, the training, I guess. But that being said, going to the event is actually very exciting. Like it's it cool, is isn't it? fun. Yeah, going to the events is crazy because it's like it's 100% just only action, right? There's no like, hey, these guys aren't even engaging. They're just circling each other. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh no, he's gonna get hit right now. Check it out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know. So it is really fun. I watched Nick Max vlog recently of oh. him, of him going and watching, um, watching it, and I was like, fuck, you know, it must have been so good out there watching that. In person, probably one of the most fun sports that I've been to, actually. Yeah, it does look good. Are you are you going to be in Vegas uh, next month when ADCC and CGI are on? Bro, my plans are so bad. I'm so bad at planning stuff more than like a, a, a week out, to be honest. So I have no idea. Honestly, I'm here until I should be in Vegas for at least like the next 11 days, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> so let me rephrase. If you are in Vegas, which oh. one are you going to go and watch? If I'm in Vegas, uh, is CGI is in Vegas at Thomas and Mac, right? CGI? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll yeah. probably go watch that because that's like where all the the like celebrities are, you know. Okay. So I'll go do I'll go do that one. 
Yeah, as a jiu-jitsu practitioner, what are your thoughts on that that whole movement from Craig made? Do you think it's uh, it's a positive thing? I, I do I do think it's positive because it takes the sport more mainstream, I believe. Like the method that he's going about it is an entertaining method. And regardless of what people think uh, that, you know, maybe might look down on it or might say, hey, you're taking from this and putting it over here. I think at the end of the day, the wider net you cast, the more likely you are to get like uh, to have a bigger impact and get quality people involved in the sport. Because now with things like this, just the same as the Jake Paul effect, right? All of the influencers that started doing the boxing stuff kind of revitalized boxing. And now all these kids, my, my little brother is 16 years old. He would have never really been interested in boxing had the whole influencer boxing not taken off. But because of that, he's like, oh, I want to box. I want to do this, you know? So I think the CJI thing is like going to uh, bring about a new wave of like younger people because they see these guys on social media and it is more entertaining. So I think it's that overall a good thing. Yeah, Craig's making himself just above jujitsu and he with what he's doing. You know, Bro, he's, he's, he's so actually funny. going mainstream, isn't he now? You know what I mean? He's fucking amazing, isn't he? A hilarious he guy. His, what was it? His latest vlog, mate. I was fucking crying. Well, he was just, doing the uh, oil wrestling in Turkey. Oh, with mate, with Luke Rockhold in fucking grabbing his cock in fucking, <laughs> yeah, with Diron who opened to get on and uh, it just looked fucking wild, didn't it? Yeah. Mate, Luke Rockhold's a legend as well, isn't he? Mm. He's a good lad. Oh, yeah. Talent. Oh, man. The, the, the talent that they have over there is fun. I should actually, I'm going to go talk to them and see if they'll throw me in as like an alternate or something. That'd be so funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, throw me in that thing as an alternate. <laughs> oh, get, a, uh, get, get a super fight or something. I should, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely say something because I think everybody's getting paid ten thousand just to show up, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's yeah. Like, yeah. So there's got to be a thing there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect with them and talk about this. This is good. <laughs> you guys have done, uh, you guys have done me a great service by giving me a, a light bulb idea. Yeah, mate. I'd love to see you on there. It'd be cool. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I, I don't watch like a ton of jujitsu, as I think is the case with many jujitsu practitioners. Right. But ADCC is always an event that I look forward to. Mm. And initially, I was a bit gutted because you just saw the divisions just just leaking away, and I was like, ah, oh, Rotolos are gone, so and so's gone. But I don't know. I think we're left with two really good events, and I completely agree. I think that moving forward, it's going to project the sport. And I think you're just going to see more and more talent coming through. Well, so yeah, ADCC now are paying more money than they paid before just yeah. by having Craig saying they're getting like two, two and a half grand each or something yeah. like that now. And that's like the health of competition, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Because of competition, um, because of competition, you get better uh, things for the athletes, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I think it's overall a good thing. Yeah, for sure. We had the um, one of the uh, European trials winners, uh, Taylor Pierman, on recently. Um, the uh, under 88 guy and yeah he said that he said it was great for him he said he's now got his own room because he was meant to share he's nice. got his own room he's getting paid he's getting show money so he was happy and that's also the beauty of social media right because like mm. now everybody kind of can be in control of their own destiny and then instead of this is no shade to ADCC this is kind of just in general instead of uh, a company putting it on and taking the majority of any earnings now because everybody kind of has a name for themselves you can get it to a point where it forces a company to pay out more, right? Or to be more, to be ah, less greedy, for lack of a better term. Even like mu the music industry, all these guys before used to have to go through a middleman and get signed to a label and all this. Now, if you're good at music, you put out the music. People will see it. You know, it kind of, it gives a more more power to the creator or to the to the individual. I even think, I think with it's like good. stuff like this. I even think with stuff like this, like podcasts and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think you know, ten or fifteen years ago, ten years ago, you would you'd have to maybe go through an intermediary and try and yeah. get some production manager or whatever. Whereas now we can just set this up, we can do it, and we can just put it out there and, and still produce really good content. Uh -huh. I think yeah, and I think that makes everybody more honest and fair with each other too. You know, instead of yeah. being like, oh, I can replace you at any time, it's like you actually can't because look at the numbers. So let's do yeah, this. Exactly. Let's make a fair yeah. deal. It gives you the power, doesn't it? It gives you yeah. the power. And then then the companies that come in, they've just got to kind of deal with you, <laughs> whether yeah. they like it or fucking not. And, and that just makes it so much more, like, I just believe that it makes it more honest and fair because instead of downplaying somebody or what, you can't really. It's like, well, we need you and you need us. So it's mutually beneficial instead of being like kind of a, a, a leachy system, right? Yeah, 100%. PJ, we'll let you go soon, mate, because it's, it's near our bedtime and uh, we've kept you long enough, my man, so I appreciate it. Is there anything else that you kind of want to wrap up with? Anything you've got going on you want to talk about? Um, 
you know, not really. I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna watch these weigh-ins right now. Uh, about to go watch these Jake Paul, Mike Perry weigh-ins and uh, make a little content around that. But I appreciate you guys having me on. If you guys want to follow me, this is my personal brand right here. And then if you guys want to follow Happy Punch, just it's just Happy Punch. That'd be amazing. And I appreciate you guys having me on. This is my most favorite podcast that I've ever done in my life. So please, everybody, <laughs> subscribe and follow. Appreciate that, mate. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate of it. Of course. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Cheers, my love.